Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Edge Hill University. My name is George Tolbus. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here. I'm pleased to see that our speaker has, has returned. I feel like he's lost him there for a moment. And always alarming when you see you're in all your lecture disappearing out of the lecture <laughs> theatre as the audience is arriving. Anyhow, you're very welcome to what is the fourth in this year's series of inaugural lectures and the first of four inaugural lectures by professors of computing at the university. The growth of computing here as a discipline over the last few years has been quite remarkable really. When I started here just over five years ago, computing was buried within the business school. Um, we, we liberated it from, uh, from there and it, it began to grow like Topsy, really, and uh, in the last three years, applications to study here have, have more than doubled, and the numbers on the courses have followed through that trajectory with improved conversion year on year as well. And this year is no exception to that in terms of, of the applications. To the point, in fact, where two years ago, just over two years ago, uh, we opened this building as a home for media and for computing, and now the combined two different departments of uh, media and computing have become too large for the building. So recently, our Board of Governors has approved a £10 million investment next year for what will be a new home for the Department of Computing, which is due to open next September. So, it's a, it's a rising tide for computing, and we're delighted to have uh, now four professors in place. The first one of those who is going to uh, give his inaugural this evening is, is Mark Anderson, who joined us about seven or eight years ago, I think, eight years ago, um, before, before I got here. In fact, Mark um, did his PhD at the University of Liverpool. He worked in industry for a number of years before entering academia. Um, he runs the Centre for Data Analysis and Representation, or CEDAR, here and uh, is, is an important part of uh, a growing and thriving team, really. And it is particularly apt that we should have our first computer science lecture uh, during the week in which we're under sustained cyber attack um, as, uh, as the university sector. Um, he may well have something to say about that. I know that there's a certain amount of interactivity planned for this evening, and if you registered and you received the email, you will have been warned to, uh, to have your Android device ready to, uh, to follow some of the things that happen in the course of the lecture. If you didn't have that email and you haven't registered and you've wandered in on spec, uh, now is probably the time to, uh, to download those apps to be ready for uh, what Mark is going to show to you. However, um, it's Mark that you came to listen to this evening and not me, so I over now to Professor Mark Anderson. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, thanks for all coming along as well. Um, hopefully then, um, what I wanted to talk about really and what I um, kind of wanted to convey was how exciting computing can actually be. That was the, kind of the underlying message that I really wanted to get to. And I pondered for quite a while about what would be quite a, a grabbing subject, hopefully something to engage people and something to, to, to give the audience um, uh, so, um, a way of being able to interact with, with the talk, because you don't really want to listen to me talk for an hour, because I mean, my students will tell you that that's probably not the most exciting thing. But um, what I decided to do then was look at computing as an art form. So. Hopefully, as we go through, uh, through this uh, talk, through some of the ideas that we've got here, um, I'll be able to um, introduce you to um, the art, really, of computing, and hopefully dispel some of the myths about people who work in computing. This is where these things don't work. So, during the talk, though, as George quite kindly said, um, there will be some interactive moments. So if you have downloaded the apps, that's great. Um, if you haven't, don't worry, we have a couple of tablets that we'll be able to um, hand out so you'll be able to see um, 
some of these, um, these interactive type displays. Again, it's to take focus off me so you can kind of look at some more interesting stuff. Um, and you'll be able to um, experience really some of the work that we've been doing over the past few years. So um, hopefully they will work um, as we go through the evening. If not, I've got other ways of being able to demonstrate what we've been doing. So the thing to look out for then will be um, our little uh, Android character. And that will sort of give, that'll give you an indication really uh, when, to, uh, when you'll need to use the apps. And I'll tell you if you have downloaded the apps, which ones you'll need to run at different times because there's two of them for us to have a look at tonight. So I started off by saying that this is going to be a talk where we're kind of going to dispel that myth about people who are in computing. And I was going to be a little bit um, cruel on our former boss there um, <laughs> to say that what computer scientists actually look like, but I took the photo out, Chris. So the, the kind of view that most people have of computer scientists is they were kind of quite dull people, were kind of quite boring. Maybe you might email us, but you wouldn't come and talk to us. Anyone who's seen the ITU crowd will know what I'm talking about. So we're kind of seen as these mathematicians, these scientists, these, well, quite frankly, geeks. And although sometimes there is geek chic, and I have been told that um, once before, which I kind of took as quite a compliment, um, what we really want to do is kind of dispel that myth, because really, as computing people, we're actually quite creative. Or well, hopefully, we're quite creative. So that's what I'm trying to open the door so um, people might want to come and talk to us and find out about the different kinds of things that we actually get involved in. And really, I thought, well, the best way to start um, to talk about this is going to be to set it all in context. So where do I actually get this kind of um, brainchild from? Where have I come from um, in terms of thinking about computing as an art form? And really, it was back in the day, long, long time ago, when I was at university, and one of our lecturers in a software engineering lecture, and again, Chris will laugh at me because he knows I hate software engineering, but um, one of, we had to throw away comment there which said that computing is kind of half engineering and half art. Not half, but half art. <laughs> so I've kind of carried that with me all these years. Nothing else in software engineering, because they don't like software engineering, as Chris will kind of uh, quite attest to. But I have carried with me that idea that we're half artists. So what we wanted to do, or what I wanted to do really, was to look at those examples of where that art form in computing actually lies and the different ways that it kind of comes out um, uh, within our field. So computing in the arts is something that you um, can find lots and lots and lots of examples of, loads of examples. You find lots of examples of computing being applied in music, for example, building synthesizers, that kind of thing. There are interesting examples of where computing has been applied in film. Um, and I wanted to pick up on two of those examples, um, really, um, just to demonstrate them because they're interesting examples of, of pro, you know, computer programming concepts that we might adopt and some of, um, some of our students have been looking at in this particular semester. Um, but they, they bring together these ideas, these principles of nature and how nature can inspire us as computing people to maybe think about solving problems in different ways, to think about writing code in different ways. So um, the principles of nature can be applied from forces all the way through to evolution. We're going to come back to this a little bit later, but just to give you these two really key moments as far as computing goes and computing in film, um, there'll be no prizes for guessing the film on the left, uh, which is the original Tron. And again, the students will tell you that we did do um, a module initiation session where I made them watch the original film Tron. It was a really tough session, wasn't it? So they watched that film. And what that film is a great example of is something called Perlin noise. So the idea of Perlin noise says that if you were just going to pick random numbers, they could jump about all over the place. So it could be naught, a million, hundred. You get all sorts of spikes in those random numbers. The idea of Perlin noise is to create random landscapes. And of course, your landscape, when I looked outside in the car park, doesn't spike up and down, but it kind of has much more of a flow to it. So the idea of Perlin noise is you'll get more of a flow, more of a sequence of random numbers that you could use to generate um, these uh, random landscapes. And so um, the, you find examples of that in films like Tron. Uh, you can kind of see the landscape there in the background. You also find it in computer games um, when random landscapes are being generated. But that was the very first example of Perlin noise being used. And the other film, the one on the right, um, I was going to say any price for guessing that one. And again, I made all the students uh, watch that particular film. And 
No, it's Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Um, and again, we all had to sit down and watch that as a piece of coursework, didn't we, one week. And the whole idea there was that um, that was the first example of particle systems. Again, a really important concept related to nature. So each particle acts independently. It's emitted from a single point, um, and it responds to its environment in some way or another. But um, the first papers about particle systems were written about that film. Now, I wanted to use those examples to show how the art has really um, influenced computing and it's influenced some of the thinking in computing. And that, that's great. That, that's um, kind of computing related to the art, but that wasn't really where I was um, looking at as far as this particular talk goes. Because what I wanted to think about was computing itself as an art form. I wanted to think about how we could be considered to be artists in some form or another. So, we'll go back to that original statement. We're half artists, artists and half engineering. And so, very, very broadly, very kind of holistically, if we just took computing to consist of three main elements, I know it's not 100% true, but we'll go with this for now. Uh, my definition for the period of this talk is computing consists of hardware. In other words, the physical device that something is going to run on. It consists of software, the code that's actually doing something, and it consists of data, the stuff that's actually being processed. And what I wanted to do, or what I set out to do, was to look at those three things in turn and see where a, an art form might exist or how we, as computing people, might um, utilise those components of computing as artist tools. So um, it starts out as a bit of a... Um, a bit of a challenge, but I was thinking about hardware as an, as an art itself. So here we're thinking about the actual devices. And there was a really um, nice example of the use of computing, or a different use of computing rather, to draw in non-traditional computer scientists, to draw in people from the art. Um, so whether they were musicians or whether they were artists. Um, it was developed in Sweden, developed in, in uh, New York City as well, in America, and that was the idea of physical computing, and it's something that we do here um, quite successfully um, in our department. So a lot of students take up this option um, to build devices. And the whole idea, and I use this strap line time and time again in these, in these classes, is that we're trying to take computing out of the box. In other words, we're not actually going to uh, write a piece of code on one of these black boxes that sits under the table, we're going to look at a screen, we're going to move a mouse, and we're going to click a keyboard. No, 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 no. What we want to do is we want to build things that you can interact with and play with in very different ways. So we want to actually bring um, that level of computing to um, a more sort of accessible um, set of devices. And so um, what I've got is a couple of videos um, and a couple of examples, really, of the kinds of devices that we might think about when we're looking at hardware forming part of an art form, if you like. And in this, these particular examples, all of them are related to the development of musical instruments. So what we're looking at is creating music in a different way, creating music using um, hardware, but not standard hardware devices. So... The, um, the picture at the top left there is a musical glove. The idea is you press the fingers together and it'll play notes. Um, hopefully, we will be able to see in this bottom one, if I can get it to work, and I'll just whiz it along a little bit because it's quite a long video and I haven't learned how to edit videos even though I'm talking about art forms. Um, so, we have a student here who's created a whole new musical instrument. Mm -hmm. When you press the button, the notes change. And this one changes the high. So. And I think that kind of hopefully gives you a little bit of an example of these are computer science students or computing students, but they're thinking about how to create art by building devices that they can interact with. And it's in that kind of respect, um, I've, I've, I was drawing on the idea of um, hardware itself as being an art. It's, it's um, a mechanism here for constructing some sort of art form. And this is a, another example. I'll just show you a brief clip of what this one does. But again, it's being 
it's, it's actually a machine-driven uh, musical instrument that uh, one of our students, oops, that one of our students has built. There's a, we threw to one of my next slides, but never mind. So if I just move this along a little bit and see if we can and get play. continuous play mode, where the specified note is played repeatedly. Press all three buttons again, we'll be in mode three, which plays a preset so sequence of notes. And if we press all three again, so again, it's another example, really. Students kind of think, or computing people, thinking creatively. In this case, thinking creatively about the physical device, how they might interact with it, and what kind of outputs that physical device is going to generate. So hardware as an art form um, really kind of falls into that physical computing field. I then wanted to move on and think about um, programming as an art form, but not in the same respect that people like Donald Nuth might have talked about um, the art of programming. Donald Nuth set out to write a 12-chapter um, book in the early 60s. Then it expanded to about seven volumes. Currently, we're only at about volume four, uh, 4A. We might have hit volume five by now. But a very seminal book, but it's really about algorithms. It's really about the, the science, that engineering element. And as I quite like to say, or I like to think, I don't like software engineering, so we're kind of, Chris keeps laughing at me. So we're going back to the art form of actually programming. So how could we think about programming perhaps as an art form? Well, maybe we could think about it in the same way that a musician might think about notes on a stave, in the same way that a songwriter might think about lyrics. There are many, many ways to skin a cat, many ways to solve uh, problems in programming. And really, for those programmers who are very creative in developing their solutions, they're the people who are going to come up with the innovative solutions. They're going to come up with new ideas for how to solve problems. Um, it, was quite once it was once quite famously said by um, a strategist in, in a sport that if we carry on doing the same things all the time, we'll never get any better, we'll only stay at that same point. And the same is true of us, really, as computing people. If we kind of think outside the box and try things in a very different way, if we treat this as an art form, then we will come up with very novel solutions. So there's many, many different ways that we could actually um, write code. And we could actually think about our own code as being an expressive form. But I wanted then, I started then thinking about code in a slightly different way. And just in the same way as with art, you get abstract art. We also have a concept of abstract code. Now the idea here is that we might write the code in such a way that it looks like it's going to um, achieve what we set out to write that code to do. And in order to achieve that, to write very abstract code, quite often we'd have to use something called obfuscation. So the idea there is you write your code in a very condensed way that's kind of quite mean because nobody else can ever understand it. But that's true of any code I write anyway. Um, strip out all the comments, which um, students should never do that. And, because they know I'm moan at them all the time for that. Um, but then we can lay out code in such a way that it nearly forms a kind of artwork in its own right. And this is quite a classic example. So the example here, um, we've got um, a piece of C code that apparently works and it will model a flight simulator. And it's laid out to look like a plane. I probably really shouldn't say this, but I've tried it, it doesn't work. But it looks nice anyway. <laughs> uh, heck, if I'd have done it, it probably wouldn't work either. But um, it's quite a neat um, example really of maybe how we can think about um, programming as an abstract form of art, as much as I'm saying that if we think of our code as an expressive form, um, it nearly becomes a kind of signature for how we go about solving problems. So we could look at programming in a couple of different ways in terms of being an art form, which um, is quite nice uh, in many ways. However, the most, hopefully the most interesting part of, um, of where I'm going tonight is having a look at data, really, as the art form. Data is obviously one of the largest, most important elements in terms of computing, because obviously we could write code as much as we like, but if we don't have any data, most of the time it's not going to do very much at all. And the idea of representing data in a very visual format is nothing really that new. It dates back to the 18th, 19th century. But what we've seen in recent years is a real drive towards creating 
more artistic forms of data representation. And that can either be for one of two reasons. Usually, and kind of um, obviously, it might, be, it might be to help understanding. So we can look at that visualization and work out what the data is saying. It can be quite difficult sometimes to trawl through um, large amounts of numeric data or, or text-based data and derive what the meaning is. So we have mechanisms that we can apply, and I'll, I'll show you an example of that, which might be um, to create a, a kind of art form, but really it's going to infer meaning so we can understand a little bit more about that particular data set. But actually, there's another element of this, and that is using the data as a creative form. And hopefully, this is going to be one of the parts where these, um, these apps are going to uh, come into their own, because we will look at an example of a creative form of representing data, so how we could actually use it as an art form. Um, Joe over there is laughing at me because it's um, some work that he did. So, data visualization. Actually, when, if, if we're kind of interpreting data um, in a way to understand it, usually it's in terms of infographics or it's going to be some sort of representation. I thought we're heading towards Christmas, so I might as pick how to, uh, how to create cocktails. Um, and it's very quick and easy to have a look at a representation like that and understand really what the data is telling you, what the information is actually telling you about that particular representation. It really draws on design principles. It draws on the fact that you might have to understand the metaphors or the story that you want to tell. But, I mean, that's quite a simple example, but it's very quick and easy from that to derive how to make particular cocktails. Um, so, really, the, the idea of using data to represent, uh, sorry, using visual representations with data to understand it can be very helpful. It can also be quite unhelpful as well. So, in this particular case, I've just picked a very quick example of a graph just to show um, how data sets might be difficult to um, understand, even if they're visualized. So, in this case, we're taking um, a census from Ottawa in 1875. There's a very good reason why I picked that particular data set. Um, it's related to a project work that we're doing. And really, all that's showing at the moment is the frequency of surnames within a particular geographic area in Ottawa in that particular time period. Now, it's kind of useful in some respects because you can look at that and see there's quite a lot of um, uh, people with the surname Brunel, for example, but you can't infer anything else from that data set. In other words, you might describe it as being univariate. So you, you're just looking at one particular factor here. You're looking at a, a particular surname, how many people of that surname lived in that area, but you can't actually get much else from that particular data set. What we can do, though, um, as confusing people, if we're being a little bit more creative, is come up with different ways of being able to represent those data sets. So in this particular case, if we actually took that geographic location, um, if we built a model of it, and then um, we could actually colour in, so in this case, um, I've coloured in all the representations of the nationalities, um, just by using tick boxes, on that geographic location, on a model that we've built for a project, we're not only we can not only tell um, how many people of a particular nationality lived in that area, but also where they were located. So we've got some, some more um, data being presented in quite um, a, a, an easy to read format. So we can tell, for example, how many people lived close to the church, because you can see the church in the bottom corner there, even though it's actually moved on the map and it should be in the middle, but never mind. Um, but also you get a sense of where the different groups and the different cultures might have existed. So just by being a bit more creative in terms of um, a, a computing person being able to represent data, then we can actually also derive a lot more meaning. So we can kind of take that art form idea and build 3D models um, that actually have some kind of use to them so we can derive extra meaning within them. However, um, this is the point where hopefully things are going to work. The more interesting aspect of looking at data is really looking at data itself as a creative tool. So rather than taking the data and trying to represent its original meaning, what we might want to do is take hold of that data and then represent it in a totally different way. 
Um, so what we're really looking at is maybe to reinterpret the data, to remodel the data, to visualize it in very um, different ways, to form artworks. So we did, um, or uh, I've worked on a project in partnership with um, a university over in Canada. And the idea here was that um, what we'd take was concepts from media theorists, so people like the Canadian Harold Innes, and extract data from one source and apply nature or rules or some other interpretation to be able to represent it in a very different way. So what we wanted to do then was to, to reinterpret some of this data. And the data that we had to use, some of it was from DNA data sets um, from the um, American uh, databases, and other data was from passages of the Bible. So we took two um, sections of data, two different streams of data, and created two different artworks. One of those, uh, sorry, each was split into five parts. And in this particular case, somebody's already wishing ahead. <laughs> it's very exciting, I don't know. Um, so, what, uh, what I'm hoping to do is help you or let, enable you to be able to see these particular art installations. But before we do, um, I have a video here. So this is a video actually from the installation. So this, um, this particular artwork was um, generated by a set of musicians based over in Canada who took um, passages from the Bible and generated music from them. They were given artistic license, so they did tweak it a little bit more than just literally convert into musical notes. Um, uh, a visual art form that was created by um, people um, both in Canada and at Edge Hill and also um, an augmented reality app that was created over, over here at Edge Hill um, by Joe over there. I said I'd blame him if it didn't work. And um, I thought, uh, well, first of all, I'll show you what this artwork looked like actually in situ. So we ran this um, in the middle of a traffic island, or a roundabout in our terminology, in Canada, sat there for a week in the sun, and it did work, um, and demonstrated really this idea of creating augmented reality art. So if you just look behind the phone, you can see a huge big statue and a QR code from time to time. And what we have here is a projection of an art form in augmented reality. So, now I didn't want to play all of that because, as, uh, as I say, there are actually um, two pieces, each with five movements, and it goes on for quite a long time. Um, really, if you were going to uh, have a look at that, I think it's um, about nearly about half an hour, I think, in, in actual playtime. Um, but what happens is it will circulate through different models and different pieces of music. Um, playing those um, at that particular location. So, I asked everybody um, before you came to the talk to download an app or two apps. And hopefully, if you downloaded the app that was called Inaugural, if you want to start that app up. And when you start that app, if you point it at that QR code, he says, hopefully, as it runs, if it runs, hopefully you will get a sense of um, the kind of um, artwork that we created. We have one working, we. <laughs> so hopefully what you might end up seeing is projected somewhere up there, um, a multicolor cube, hopefully it's rotating um, with a little odd bit poking out of it, and some music. So all of that has been generated from um, passages uh, from the Bible, um, but I, I wanted to really kind of give a sense of um, what um, what datascapes looked like, so in situ. Oh, sometimes it stops. Um, but what I will do is I'll make these available afterwards, so um, if you want to download the apps and, and have a look at them um, at your leisure, um, the, like I say, there's about half an hour's worth 
of, uh, of datascapes that you could play through. Unfortunately, it doesn't stop. It'll just carry on playing, but never mind. Uh, I'll shout over the top of it. I thought it would drown my voice out. So that was kind of the point that we'd um, reached in terms of representing data in an art form, as, as an art form. But really, there are so many other areas that we can develop in or we could actually move forward on in terms of creating art forms either out of data, out of code, or out of hardware. So some of the areas where we may start looking are going to be in fully immersive environments. So we could um, present um, our artworks within using these, these headsets, so things like Google Card, um, so you could actually be in the middle of the, um, the, uh, the artist's um, display. Uh, we could have cognitive computing. So the idea with that is that we can uh, interpret um, the data in some way or another and make predictions about it and then use those to create um, artworks that we might present. But the area that's really interesting, and again, some of uh, the, the students who are here will hopefully agree, that we're looking at, at the moment is really comes back to what I started talking about, which is nature-inspired computing. So taking these ideas of nature and applying them in a computing um, artistic context. So we could look at things like fractals. So fractals are patterns that repeat in nature. Um, they can be never-ending. Um, and they can also uh, exist within mathematical formulae, within computing. So um, there's an example on the slide here. Um, obviously, on the left, we've got a fern leaf. On the right, a computer-generated fern leaf, generated from within fractals, just to give you um, a rough idea, really, of what, um, what I'm talking about with this idea that we've got repeating <coughs> patterns here. But probably more interestingly is going to be work related to evolutionary computing. So Darwinian theory, the idea that we can find things that are getting close to a solution. Uh, we can find those elements that have the best fit, create what they call a mating pool, parents, and um, generate offspring through generations. So that's a, a very interesting area um, of computing where we can generate art. But perhaps the most um, interesting was some work that we did quite recently and, and some of our, our students are currently looking at, and that's using the concept of neural networks. And really, all a neural network does is it can, it's, it's supposed to be a, a representation of um, how the brain works. So the idea is we have a lot of small nodes that do quite simple tasks. They're called neurons. They um, have a number of inputs and they have an output. And they just run in parallel um, constantly um, processing data. And the, the kind of tasks that a neural network is designed for is to look for patterns. So the whole goal of a neural network is to try and find patterns in something. So you might create a neural network which is going to find patterns in financial transactions, for example, for um, real ap applicability or real use. So it might be in some sort of um, scientific processing. Um, what's really interesting about a neural network is that they can learn. And the way that happens is that all the connections between the neurons, between each of those nodes, carry a weight. And changing the weights between each of those nodes changes how that network is going to run. So it changes maybe the order in which the, um, uh, the messages are fired from one neuron to another. In other words, they can be trained. So you might show or, or teach um, a network something, and then it will start trying to pick out those patterns. And the idea is, if it's got many, many layers, it will get more and more and more precise in identifying particular patterns. So. The idea of a neural network, we're just going to use a lot of nodes connected together in software to try and find patterns in something. But why I picked on neural networks is because there's a really interesting project out there which is all about creating art form uh, or artworks, but it uses neural networks. And the idea of Google's Deep Dream uh, code is this. You can use pre-trained networks, so they already know the kinds of things that they're looking for. You can give it an image. And it will start looking through that image, trying to find patterns, trying to identify what it thinks is something in that image. It might not be something in that image, but it's what it thinks is something in that image. And really, what Google's Deep Dream does is it kind of uses a byproduct. Most people will create a neural network with the idea that it's going to try and find a pattern. They'd run it all, however many iterations, all the way through to the end to find a solution. But what uh, Google's Deep Dream does is that gives you all the intermediate steps. And that's really where the art forms are going to happen. Because as it processes every, uh, the image through every single cycle, identifying these things, these patterns that it's looking for, then it will generate 
different images or different pieces of artwork. So it's, kind of, it's quite an interesting concept, really, that uses nature-inspired programming. So just to give um, an example of what that might produce, um, in the case of the images on the left, um, what really the, um, the neural network is looking for in that case are things that it thinks are people and things that it thinks are vehicles. And it starts with a picture of Creative Edge, where there's no vehicles and no um, people in it at all. But as it's processed that image, it's picked out features. And the network itself will try, will try and recognise those features as something that it knows about. And so it's replaced parts of the image with things that it believes are there. Kind of like some sort of weird night out drinking or something. But it believes that's what actually exists in that image. And that's only so many iterations through. If you keep running that over and over again, you'll get very, very different images because it works from one image to the next. So as it keeps running through iteration, 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 it will then believe that there's something else in there. I was relieved just to find that I wasn't in it, but never mind. Um, the other one with the art center, that's been trained then to look for things like animals um, and also um, for vehicles and people. So if we start with the art center at the top, when you look at the bottom image, um, that bush there, it believes is some sort of weird dog-like creature. I did say it kind of looked like my dog, but he's a bit more handsome than that. Um, or a weird kind of budgie type creature, and there's a, a weird kind of train. But again, what's going on here is that the neural network thinks it's found things in that image, so it manipulates the image to start to look like um, those particular items that it believes it's found. All I would say is that whoever's trained it, whew, it, it can't spot very much useful, but it is creating really interesting art forms. And I wanted to kind of um, nearly finish on that, nearly finish on that point um, by saying that, you know, we have got this, this kind of future where these, these really unusual art forms can be generated. And certainly these are, um, these are, these are the kinds of technologies that we're looking at. Both our students and myself are very interested in looking at these particular um, ways of developing art and ways of being creative because, as I said right at the start, that's the kind of myth that I wanted to dispel. We don't just sit there and think about zeros and ones, but we can think of some weird, wacky stuff as well, which is great. Um, I was once described as the excited puppy of computing, and I quite like that. So, I've been described as many things, that's the one I always stick with. So, again, um, I want to say thank you, thank you really for listening, and also, um, at this particular point, you will notice that there is another app. So, if you have the one that's called Xmas, um, or Christmas if you want it, um, it was supposed to be the Christmas lecture, but um, I'm a little bit early, but never mind, because uh, the shops are full of Christmassy stuff anyway. So, if you would like to open that app and point it at that picture, um, I thought I'd have a, a little passing message for you, and it would be very annoying. And for anybody who sat here in the middle-ish, you've got the best view. It's a Christmas scene, of course. Um, so, yes, there we go. And hopefully the little bell's ringing and all sorts. I literally spent min uh, hour, minutes, putting that, uh, hours putting that together. But what I ho really hoped we could do, or I hoped we could do, is, is really demonstrate that, as computing people, we are kind of quite creative. We do like doing different things. We don't look like traditional computer scientists all the time. And, yeah. and, um, and also, um, I just want to say a huge big thank you for putting up with me and listening, for, uh, listening to me for the last uh, however many minutes, 40 minutes, or whatever. Uh, yeah, so thank you once again. Okay, well, thanks very much, Mark. Um, my name's Kevin Burney. I'm an Associate Dean for Research in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And, uh, it's uh, my great uh, privilege and pleasure to give uh, the vote of thanks this evening. I think, as George said at the start, it really is difficult to believe that uh, computing was uh, only established in this building as an independent department in its own right uh, just over two years ago, because so much has happened since then. Uh, student applications have uh, really gone from record levels on a year-from-year -year basis, and already, indeed, uh, up on last year, uh, in the early stages of uh, this year for next uh, year's recruitment. The uh, employability of our computing graduates is one of the highest in the country, approaching 92%. And uh, research in the department has also gone from strength to strength as well. Uh, 
as is reflected in Mark's lecture this evening. And uh, that is, of course, uh, is down to the um, dedication and the hard work of um, Mark, uh, all our staff in computing, and uh, in particular, our first head of computing, Chris Beaumont, who's in the audience with us this evening. Now, as George mentioned, uh, Mark uh, joined us just eight years ago. Uh, before that, uh, he had uh, really a wide-ranging experience in software development uh, in commerce. And uh, given his views on software, he didn't perhaps understand why he's decided to pursue an academic uh, career. And uh, since uh, joining uh, academia, he's really uh, rapidly established himself uh, as a, you know, a, a foremost researcher in his field. And indeed, uh, Mark's full list of publications is so long and extensive, it's, you know, it's impossible for me to read it out. But to give you an indication of what I mean, uh, in just this year, just 2015, he's already had uh, six uh, research outputs uh, either submitted or accepted for publication. And those are the ones that, that I'm just aware of. So you can imagine what his, his full CV looks like. Well, um, Mark uh, promised at the start that he would try to dispel some myths about you know, computing being dumb and dreary. And uh, I'm sure you will agree with me that uh, his lecture this evening uh, was anything but that. And uh, Mark has already indicated that uh, we do have uh, some wine and refreshments outside. And Mark has already indicated that uh, he will be happy to take some questions about his, his lecture over a few light refreshments and a glass of wine. But uh, we, before we allow Mark to uh, get his uh, richly deserved rewards, uh, if you can join with me uh, in thanking him once again for what uh, I'm sure he'll be his most stimulating. <laughs>